Hello and welcome. On today's showcase, it's Almost Famous, David Copperfield and Herb Alpert. Amen! <laughs> Our movie almanac looks at a timeless love letter to the rockers of the 1970s. Whether I turn out to be the hero of my own story. David Copperfield gets a new movie adaptation. He has built his career on touching people, not just through songs, but through... And musician Herb Alpert is about to get his own documentary. Showcase is taking a look at the movies that define their eras in a series called Movie Almanac. We begin with September the 13th in the year 2000. That's when Cameron Crowe directed a love letter to his days working as a music journalist in the film Almost Famous. This is William Miller. Yes, it is. I think he should be writing for us. From Cameron Crowe. Most movies about the music in times of the 1970s built myths about the decade. Cool. God, it's gonna get ugly, man. They're gonna buy you drinks. But 20 years ago, with Almost Famous, director Cameron Crowe decided to go behind the smoke screen. Amen. He gave a different flavor to movies set in the 1970s by providing a fan's perspective. Before becoming an Oscar-winning movie maker, Cameron Crowe was a music journalist for Rolling Stone magazine, and he covered all the big names, from The Who to Led Zeppelin. That's the flower, the kid. Almost Famous provides a candid reimagining of Crowe's early teenage life on the road with such rock legends. It tells the story of Crowe's alter ego, William Miller as an aspiring rock journalist who goes on tour with the fictional band Stillwater. Along the way, Miller meets like-minded young women who are fans of music that also inspire the musicians. In Crow's own words, almost famous is a love letter to 1970s music. And this statement is evident throughout the film. He features stars from the day, like Peter Frampton, and he uses such hits of the decade, like Elton John's Tiny Dancer and The Who's Sparks, to make cinematic statements about friendship and pursuing your dreams. Incidentally, two of the main recurring themes in the script, which eventually won a Best Screenplay Oscar. One of the biggest strengths of the film, however, lies in its ability to cinematically retell events Crow experienced firsthand, like the near plane crash scene that brings the film to its final crescendo, which happened to Crow when he was touring with The Who. Fans of the musical epic include such famous names like Brian Wilson of the Beach Boys, and they all agree that it captures the essence of the 1970s. I have to go home. You are home. Let's talk to Sarah Happola, who recently penned a retrospect of Almost Famous for the Houston Chronicle. Hi, Sarah. So, having read your piece, I see that you greatly enjoyed this movie. You actually said that if Cameron Crowe were a song, I would sing him out loud right now. So tell us why you think this movie is that good. Um, I think this movie is just a beautiful retrospective of a bygone era. You know, I think when you watch it now, what you really notice is how much affection it has for what we would think of now as like a tactile age, like the albums and the ticket stubs and the scratch of the record. Um, I just think this is a movie about loving music. And as somebody who grew up loving music, I connect to it so strongly. And I think the director is uh, serving the god of detail, you know, because uh, it's just such a rich movie, isn't it? Yeah, that's exactly it. You know, um, it, it, it really does notice both the, the small human details in the sound of music, the sound of music that connects in our soul, but it also notices the details between 
uh, people. You know, the first scene where you see Kate Hudson meeting Billy Crudup, which is the Penny Lane character. You know, there's no words in that scene. They just stare at each other. Mm -hmm. uh, it's one of little human details that the movie gets right um, without ever saying anything. Okay, so um, Sarah, would you say that it's a great rock movie? Obviously, it's a great movie and it's a great coming of age movie, maybe. But do you think that it's a great rock and roll movie? Yeah, I think it is a great rock and roll movie. I think a lot of rock and roll movies focus on the excess and they don't really have a real conscience about the damage of both that lifestyle. I think this is um, a movie that takes us behind the scenes and shows us both the exhilaration of the music, but also the cost on the lives of the people that live it. Mm -hmm. um, and and I think that it really does capture this era of 70s music, this stadium, the, the thrill of the stadium. Um, yeah, no, I, I, I think mm -hmm. it's because also you see the grandiosity of the, the people living that life, but also their just ridiculousness, which I think is important to, to see both the beauty and the absurdity. I asked that because uh, Anne Hornaday from the Baltimore Sun, for example, uh, she says that it really lacks the drive and pulse that makes for a great rock and roll movie. And some critics and some, you, you know, audiences said that it sort of lacked the sort of cliches, the sex and drugs and, you know, that crazy lifestyle and all that. It really has an innocent tone and that does not bother you. And quite the contrary. I mean, I think the fact that it has an innocent tone is what makes the movie stand out. The idea that it lacks sex, drugs, and rock and roll, which were cliches, you know, then, um, I think we've seen so much of that. And I think what we haven't seen is the other spirit that was undergirding those things. You know, um, cliches flatten human stories. And I think what this does is try to pull out the the other parts that had gotten lost in 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 those old stories. I mean, I think what you can fault it for is being a little too maybe too generous to its characters. Like perhaps those people were not quite as sweet, but we have to remember <laughs> that it is through a 15-year-old's eye. And so the movie really, you know, I think most of us see and fall in love with music through innocent eyes as well. It's almost like a high school comedy without the high school in it, isn't it? That's exactly right. I mean, you know, it, it really is almost like a story about prom that happens to be written <laughs> about going backstage at a, a, a giant stadium concert. Okay, we keep talking about why this movie is so great and all that, but then, despite being nominated for, I guess, four Oscars and having won one, it failed to break the bo at the box office. And why do you think that was the case? You know, I think this movie might have been a disappointment because it came on the heels of Jerry Maguire, which had been such a blockbuster movie for Cameron Crowe. But I don't think, and I, you know, I think this movie is considered a classic movie in its own way. Um, you know, even if it was a modest success at the box office, because it really stayed with people. I mean, I think people have a very strong connection to this film. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that you can see like every one of the actors, they they were successful at the time, but, but every one of them has gone on to continue to have uh, a really interesting career. Of course, it's one of, I think it's one of the highlights for Philip Seymour Hoffman, who basically had a career of highlights, but is now um, somebody that we lost to drugs. And so there are these really kind of heartbreaking codas that the movie has. I also think, again, we live in a technological age, and this is a love letter to the analog age. Mm -hmm. I think it has significance that we didn't quite realize in 2000. Rem and, you know, it's an American movie, and that movie hits a year before 9-11. So in some ways, it is, uh, you know, a callback to a more innocent time. Okay, so you say that it's a love letter to the analog age in a digital and technological era. Do you think the movie is still relevant 
I think that it's a slice of nostalgia. And I think that it's still a movie that can speak to audiences because it is that eternal coming of age story. I mean, look, the culture changes, music changes, technology changes, but there is always a part of us that is opening up to the larger world and having to be disillusioned of our fantasies and also reaching out into something beyond us to connect. It's a movie that is about much more universal themes about belonging and belonging inside of ourselves and coolness uh, and wanting to be somebody that we're not. I think all that stuff, um, I think all that stuff is still relevant. So it's both a time capsule and also like an eternal story. All right, Sarah Heppola, it was lovely having you on our show today. Thanks a lot. Thank you. David Copperfield is getting a new movie adaptation 85 years since the 1930s film found acclaim. Let's see how they compare. All we have is yours, Master Copperfield. Our domestic comfort. MGM produced the first non-silent film adaptation of David Copperfield in 1935. To give it a prestige production quality, the movie company hired famed art director Cedric Gibbons, Oscar-winning actor Lionel Barrymore, and prolific director George Cukor. Upon its release, the epic earned almost $3 million at the box office, or $57 million in today's cash. It was called the most satisfying screen manipulation of a great novel. As with every book adaptation, sections of the text had been omitted, like David's boarding school life at Salem House, to fit the film's two-and-a-half-hour running time. But according to New York Magazine, due to the enormous success of the release, not many people complained. Whether I turn out to be the hero of my own story, or whether that station will be held by anybody else, these moments must show. Now, almost nine decades later, we have the personal history of David Copperfield. And it's ours, David, to go wherever we choose. This version was immediately dubbed a radical adaptation by the press. First, it's a low-budget $15 million production. Very ill. Very ill. Very ill. Dangerously ill. She's dead. We're very sorry. And instead of a high-concept director, it has satirist Armando Iannucci. But critics agree that the big element that gives the film a radical edge is what L.A. Time calls its colorblind casting of Dev Patel for the title character. Time magazine praises the British Indian actor's performance as a winning one that makes a Dickensian hero for all. According to the magazine, just like with his previous films, Iannucci gives the movie a slapstick heart that contrasts with the serious tone of the 1935 version. The personal history of David Copperfield had a successful start at the festival circuit. But instead of a May international opening, it had to wait until recently to be widely released. So far, the film managed to earn only $10 million worldwide, making it one of the most recent victims of the COVID pandemic. It is, in fact, written memory. And you have quite the ride on the way. Japan's traditional no theater is struggling to adapt to a new normal under the coronavirus. So the performers are pushing to find a solution. Nur Sena has more. No is a classical musical drama that dates back to the 8th century. It's performed by mostly male actors. It has a minimalist approach to costumes and setup. And one of the most historic places to see it, the ancient North Theatres, is in danger of closing down. 
For months, the theatres in Japan have been closed over COVID-19. And now, the government says they can reopen, but with fewer members in the audience. That's good for health, but bad for business. With coronavirus and the need to avoid crowds, it becomes difficult to get people to come and watch. We can only sell one in every two seats, and that's a problem, because we have only half the ticket returns to pay the artists and the rent. We're in a situation where the more we work, the further into the red we go. That's why many of us have decided just to stop performing until the end of the year. A lot of things have become virtual during the pandemic. Artists have been performing online. The no actor Kanosuke Nakamori says no could lose its charm if it's not live. We could distribute all our performances on video, but I'm not sure the feedback would be great. No is an art form that doesn't have much movement, and you have to see it live to appreciate the energy and the music, the intensity and the songs. All that doesn't come over very well on video. No is not the only national treasure of Japan. Kabuki Theatre and Banraku Puppet Theatre are also well loved. But Nakamori's father, who taught his son the old art form, says the other theatres have various sources of financial aid, either public or private. No theatre, on the other hand, depends on ticket sales only. <laughs> Getting a sponsor might be a longer-term solution, but the introduction of a certain commercial capitalism would probably make it hard to preserve our art as it is. It's a balance that's hard to find. To rectify the situation and protect the future of now, they have started a crowdfunding campaign online. The hope is that this centuries-old art form can survive through the upcoming autumn. A new documentary is out about Herb Alpert, the 1960s American trumpet player. And it's a chance for the musician to talk about his other passion in life. Good evening. I'm Herb Alpert. And welcome. Herb Alpert is a cultural icon. Herb Alpert is chronicles the 60-year career of the trumpeter, label executive, and visual artist. He has built his career on touching people. But the movie also focuses on Alpert's philanthropic side, from his namesake foundation to efforts helping artists and art programs. I don't take this for granted. You know, I don't say, um, "Isn't Herb Alpert wonderful with all his success?" Uh, I, I pass it on. I didn't want to spend my money uh, putting, hanging on a, a Monet and a Van Gogh in my, my, my home. I wanted to be able to use that money for good, and uh, we're doing that, and the foundation does great work. And I'm uh, very proud of what we've been able to accomplish. But before philanthropy became such a big deal in his life, Alpert was best known for his music. After leading the Tijuana Brass in the 1960s, he enjoyed a successful solo career with hits such as This Guy's In Love With You. Yes, I'm in love. And Rise. He's also the only artist who grabbed the top spot on the US Billboard Hot 100 pop chart as both vocalist and instrumentalist. It wasn't until 1988 that he formed the Herb Alpert Foundation along with his wife, Lanny Hall. And one of the latest projects of the couple is to restore the Harlem School of the Arts that's expected to cost around $10 million. We're into like over 90 different small organizations that we help support. We have some major ones that we support. Um, I'm very much into the arts. I think the arts are the 
artists are the heart and soul of our democracy. I really think that's an important ingredient to, uh, to uh, you know, help support. Especially during a time when art institutions have suffered because of the coronavirus pandemic. For the same reason, the release of his documentary was pushed from May to October, which gives him more time to talk about the importance of giving back to the community. Just last week, Indonesia saw its highest daily increase in coronavirus cases, with more than 3,000. And one group of artists is trying to spread messages that keep people safe, while also having a little fun. suruh lockdown di rumah, sedangkan dia boring pak, boring atau e, bete lah kalau itu. Jadi dia ada hiburan tinggal keluar rumah doang, ada udah ada lukisan, foto-foto, selfie-selfie kayak gitu doang pak. Jadi dia nggak usah keluar rumah, nggak usah keluar komplek lah, istilahnya. Cuma tinggal foto-foto di sini, selfie-selfie, udah kehibur itu. Restorations are underway to piece together Beirut's neighborhoods, some centuries old, which were destroyed last month in the port explosions. Sena has more. Before August 4, the day two giant explosions decimated Beirut, these buildings adorned the streets of the city's historic neighborhoods of Jemaize and Marmikail. Among the hundreds of buildings that were severely damaged is Nabil Deb's ancestral home in Jemaize. The art collector was about to reopen the 160-year-old building as a hotel and art gallery when the blast occurred, and his dream was delayed. Blast happened, the whole facade on the north side collapses, so we could have been there, but luckily we were not there. Uh, we were maybe on the only spot in the house that wasn't, that didn't get, we didn't get a scratch. So we were very lucky, we survived very well uh, physically, and uh, the destruction was huge. Debs estimates his losses between $250,000 and $1.5 million, as some art pieces were destroyed. Luckily, he's been receiving help from the locals, who are supplying the materials to rebuild at cost. But goodwill aside, Debs says the other rebuilding that has to happen is with the government. One positive I would take from what happened is that with the blast, the political system died here and hopefully it was the last nail on their coffin. Hopefully uh, we will not have to deal with them anymore in a month, in six months, in two years, I don't know. But it certainly united the Lebanese. Uh, we, got, we need to get rid of, of that horrible system. Down Jemaize Street is Haya Juni's beauty salon and spa. It has been closed due to the coronavirus pandemic and she was hoping to recoup her losses by reopening in September. But after the port blasts, she has to think about the cost of construction before her doors will open again. It's, it's a lot. <laughs> it's a lot. Because uh, we're putting our heart and soul into it, Yane. And it's our first flagship in, in the country. We want to make it worthwhile, you know what I mean? So, a lot of money. But uh, we will do it again, for sure. The renovation work is being carried out by the Beirut Heritage Initiative with the help of UNESCO, which has launched a fund for Beirut's preservation. We believe that it's absolutely necessary first to preserve, because if this is lost, 
then nothing would be possible in terms of restoration. And uh, regarding the budget, we know that uh, there's been a first evaluation by the DGA, by the, by the administration. It's not uh, yet uh, definitive, and it's uh, several hundred million dollars that will be necessary in order to restore all the historic uh, uh, buildings. Beirut's governor says construction licenses will no longer be needed. The aim is to help alleviate both the financial cost and bureaucracy of rebuilding. In the wake of a disaster, many of these buildings' owners say should never have happened in the first place. That's it on this episode of Showcase. Our YouTube channel, Insta and Twitter pages have more from the world of culture and the arts. I'm Elif Bereketli. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.